Good morning, my beautiful humans. Thank you for joining me on another episode here on Creative Street. A bit of housekeeping. Um, last week I didn't submit an episode or I didn't release an episode. Um, it has been a little crazy on my end. Um, I do have a couple other things going on in terms of projects and like work life. So it's been a little hectic and sorry about that. Um, however, I do always want to make content um, for you all that is meaningful and impactful um, and motivating, inspiring <laughs> for you all. So I'm working at doing my best in terms of releasing these um, for you all and, you know, trying to make something new and fun and exciting every time. Uh, so because I didn't release last week, I did release an additional episode today um, with a guest um, Barum that I had. Um, so go ahead and check that one out. Um, but first listen, listen to this one. Um, so today's episode, it's going to be about, uh, cosmic consciousness. So it sounds weird and it sounds woo woo, right? But I, I do believe that there is this thing this like network of information that is unseen to us, um, almost kind of like air and electricity, how it helps us function. And um, it all provides like some sort of information to us. And so um, the idea behind cosmic consciousness and its relationship to creativity today, um, I thought it was important because Sometimes we get wrapped up in, oh, I want to be the first. Um, and we, and when we find out that we're not the first to do something, um, or we're not innovative or we're not unique or whatever, it can kind of demoralize us. But personally, I don't think that should ever let like stop you. If you have a vision for something, the reason that vision is coming to you is because you accessed some sort of that information from the ether maybe it is something that needs to come out that then inspires somebody else and so on and i mean that's how inventions and innovations are done um people get inspired by other people that are seeing something similar and just articulating and verbalizing and, and showing things in a different way um so you should never i feel like you should never let yourself get you know get demoralized just because something already exist or something similar already exists you never know how your version of that thing um obviously don't copycat but use what is already set and your vision for that one thing um and let that kind of take you um today i don't know if you're looking at the video but the piece that i'm working on i was actually looking at it and i, I uh, just a sidetrack. Um, I felt it was kind of, it was kind of plain. And so I'm adding some, um, modeling clay to it to kind of give it, um, a little bit more texture. Um, and I want to, I'm, I'm trying something new. Let's see how it turns out. <laughs> You're on this road with me. Hmm. Okay. So getting back to cosmic consciousness, I'm first talk about the concept. Um, and a lot of the books and stuff that I that I listen to, they're always talking about some version of this. Um, some people call it the Akashic Records. Um, I I refer to it as the ether. Um, and that some people call it the collective consciousness. Um, and this book called Cosmic Consciousness by Dr. I think his name is Burke. I could be wrong. Um, I'll put it in the show notes for you all to reference. Um, but he he mentions how in the East it's also called the Brahmic Splendor. And so it's this concept that has been around through many religions and and belief systems and and people reference it it's this um 
So I'll, I'll just quote it directly from him. He says that it's this universal scheme, like the, a universal scheme is woven into one piece and it's permeable to consciousness and, or, um, especially to subconsciousness throughout and every direction throughout and in every direction. Really what he's saying is just like, it's vast amounts of information that already exists. Um, and we sometimes can get, especially when you do a lot of like meditations and a lot of, it's it's these moments where you're just like, it clicks or something gets expired or something. That information was already there and your schemas found a new way to kind of connect those pieces together. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's just information from the universe. And it's funny because it's not... It's not like a hidden thing. Most uh, or a good amount of like scientists and, and researchers and inventors um, throughout history have kind of acknowledged that sometimes that information doesn't even come from them. Um, it just it just came to them. Um, and so like Burke relates that to I, I keep saying Burke, but I don't know if that's really his last name. I, it's B-U-C-K-E. So maybe it's Buck. Hold on. Actually, it's Buck. His name is Richard Buck. <laughs> Anyways, um, like there is a lot of scientists and, and, um, and inventors, they always kind of relate to that idea that it just kind of dawned on them. Um, Buck even says that like intuition and um, those aha moments, right? And it's fleeting. It's not something that it's not something that you can go looking for because when you look for it, you won't access it. You're too you're too concentrated, and you won't allow that energy to come in and like give you that moment. Um, just like intuition, intuition is so hard to describe, right? Like, you know, when you feel something like it's a gut feeling, it's always so hard to describe to somebody why you're doing this, but something in you, something in your mind, something in your heart is telling you that's not the way to go, or maybe it is the way to go. And like I mentioned, like this that type of feeling is always, or it's very often attributed to, to the ether, to, to the, these unseen forces. Um, and like I mentioned, like scientists and, and inventors and artists and creatives, they, they reference this, they, they felt some version of this, and um, it's interesting. So I started doing some research, you know, because I've always known, like, I, I remember reading through The Origin of Species, um, and Charles Darwin has always been one of my, um, like, the theory of natural selection and evolution, that has always kind of, like, been interesting to me. Um, especially because I'm just interested in humans. So obviously our biology and our mechanisms are, and the mechanisms of nature are interesting to me. Um, but I remember once learning that uh, Charles Darwin, when he was working on natural selection, um, and he was doing it off the cuffs, like Charles isn't, he wasn't a scientist. He's a naturalist. He went off on the beagle um, and was just kind of like adventuring around. And it just, it wasn't, it was one of those moments where he just kept seeing these things and he's observing and he's writing down his ideas. And I think he was like working with some, with a fellow, like a friend of his that was a scientist and was kind of developing this back and forth. And then <clears throat> like 
around the world, on the other side of the world, there was an actual scientist that was, I guess, noticing similar things. Obviously, with different words, it's not necessarily having the same experiences, but we're all in tune to different things. And there's information that comes to us in unique ways. Even though we're all seeing the same thing, we all interpret things differently. And so it seems like the scientist is also working on a similar theory. Um, His name is Alfred Russell Wallace, also attributed to the theory of natural selection. Um, The only difference is that his, Charles's friend um, told him, hey, there's this other guy that's working on something similar that you're doing. And Charles was like, oh, crap. And he went out and he published his. So that's why he's kind of credited um, with the first idea of the of the information, like the, the initial idea. And then Wallace kind of felt gypped because he was like, I've been working on this the whole time. What the hell? He jacked my idea. Um, but it's just, it's information that's out there in the ether. And so the individuals that are in tune Um, And like I mentioned, like you perceive things, um, everybody perceives unique things in different ways. Uh, You can start coming to the same conclusions. And it's not that Darwin like found out and was like, oh, I took his stuff. No, like he was working on it himself and he published it first. Um, Wallace still ended up publishing his and they did some sort of back and forth collaboration. I don't think it was a collaboration, um, not from the publications I've seen. But anyways, point being that I thought to myself, how many times in history has this actually happened? Like that to me was insane. They were working on something and it's foundational, right? Because that's what then led through to a bunch of other um scientific developments and conceptualizations and theories um was this this origins of species and this natural selection um theory and how nature functions um and so i I wondered how many times in history has this happened let's just say i found a list that goes back to the 17th century of independent and they um i guess like people that have noticed this as well they call it the multiples um where there's significant inventions or theorems or uh developments in our in our mind and like our, our framework our paradigms that were found independently right so like somebody working one side of the world or working on one project not knowing that somebody else is doing something similar and they both come to the similar conclusions it's kind of like it's kind of like a way of the universe telling you you're on the right track because if not just one person found it like multiple people are finding these things that means that there's something going on there and that's that's probably the way to go um so i kind of listed a few other examples so the natural selection one um that was in 19th century in the 19th century um around like the 1800s 1850s um by alf by wallace and, and darwin however apparently calculus was another simultaneous um, discovery in the 17th century by Isaac Newton and Godfrey Lib- Leibniz. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I'm I'm sure <laughs> those mathematicians will be like, you said it wrong. But anyways, whatever. Uh, you get it. But apparently calculus was uh, one of those multiple inventions, like independent individuals discovered or found the theorem the same way um obviously not the exact same way but they discovered it at the same time um in the 20th century uh in 1998 um there's two groups of scientists working on independent projects uh one was called um the supernova cosmology project the other one was called the high z supernova search team 
<laughs> and they both um, discovered through um, research on supernovas that the universe, not only is it expanding, but it's expanding at an accelerated rate, um, which was significant in in a, um, I don't want to say astrology, astronomy research. I think it's astronomy. Astrology is zodiac signs, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Hmm. All right. In the 21st century, though, so I, I'm trying to trying to bring it back closer to us because you're thinking, oh, but these are all you know, back in the day. Um, but that actually also happened again. Um, this time it was with CRISPR, the gene editing, um, invention that was discovered not by two, but by three independent individuals around the world. Um, one of them was Jennifer Duanda, uh, might have said her last name wrong, um, from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, the other one was Emmanuel Carpenter. Car Car Ooh, it's not Carpenter. What was his last name? Uh, Emmanuel. Ooh. Oof. Oh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Charpentier. Sorry about that. Um, from the, uh, the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. And I don't even want to try and pronounce this name because Lord knows I'm going to mess this up. Um, but it's <clears throat> Virginia just Sikniski. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, from the Vilni Vilnius University in Lithuania. Um, and like I mentioned, they discovered CRISPR and that is, I think one of the most significant scientific discoveries, um, in recent years in terms of what we're going to look like in the future and what humans are going to become and how we can change the health world, um, change our bodies, change, you know, how we interact with it, with nature around us. So <clears throat> again, like that information is out there in the ether. If you're looking for it and you're in tuned with the cosmic consciousness or the collective consciousness, you'll see similarities start popping up you'll be able to access that information. Um, <clears throat> but you're wondering, like, I'm not an inventor, or maybe you are, but like, what does that really mean? What does that mean as a creative? Um, and the way I understood this, and the way I understand this type of information is that we're all working off of the same network. We're all working off of the same information now, off of the same schemas. We may give things different names. We may um, highlight different attributes to things, but we're all working off of the same information. We all know what a tree looks like, even if the tree version in your mind is not the same tree version in my mind. Um, and so... I think in a deeper in a deeper way it means that all the possible information that we could ever want all the information that we're looking for all the everything is already out there in the universe we just need to be the antenna for that information we just need to receive that information. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, like some people do that different ways. A lot of individuals like meditate or um, 
there was a famous inventor that would, or a mathematician actually, that in his sleep, he, like he was in love with numbers. <laughs> and in his sleep, it was like the, the equations and the theorems just came to him in his sleep. So again, like accessing that, it depends on you. It depends on how you want to access that, how you can access that. That's up to you, how you want to be that antenna. But the information exists. If you're open to it, it exists. If you're open to seeing possibilities and opportunities, it exists. There is always, even though it feels like everything has already been invented, it hasn't. There's so much more to go for. There's so much more we can find. There's so much more we can learn. I think that's one of the beautiful things about humans. We will never stop learning. We will never stop growing. We will never know the final thing because the universe, the world is so vast and we ourselves are so complex that it's impossible to know everything within your lifetime. Um, so I'm a little jealous of vampires who get to live forever. But at the same time, I'm not. <laughs> um, um, but. Okay. I think there is the, at least my brain went to like the kind of negative aspect of that, right? that because there is so much to know um, and other people are discovering things, I guess, before you or at the same time as you, um, I guess it kind of puts a damper on like doing things. It kind of deflates you, deflates your ego for sure. Um, it humbles you 100%. And I feel like it kind of makes you, or at least for me, it kind of makes me feel like intimidated and more of like, what's the point? Somebody else is going to, is going to find it. So what's the point of me trying? Why can't I just go lay down and watch Netflix or whatever? And I think I can resonate with the feeling. Like I understand, obviously I just told you, like, that's literally my brain thought. Um, or my brain vomit, whatever. But just because you're not the first doesn't mean that you don't have anything to offer. I think that's the opposite to that or like the, the other side of that. You don't have to be the first to offer something. You don't have to be the first to make an impact or um, reiterate something in a new context, in a new light. You never know what's going to click with somebody. For me, when I started hearing about this Akashic record, the cosmic consciousness, see how many names it has. The first time I heard it, I was like, no. And then I read it with the same, in another book, this person said it in another way um so i think i've quoted before the alchemist by paulo coelho the first time i heard this kind of conversation this concept was when he was describing the language of the world and the heart of the world and it's very um it's a very christian uh related type of conversation um very biblical and that's not something I really resonate with so when he was like talking about the language of the world and the heart of the world I was like eh yeah all right sure as I've grown up and I read more and more books and I see my little documentaries and I, 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 I learned from other individuals the same concept keeps coming up just different name and so with the different names I've been able to okay 
I see, I get the gist. I have the idea. I can call it whatever I want, but I understand the foundation of the concept. And I don't have to call it the heart of the world or the language of the world. Uh, I can call it cosmic consciousness. I can call it collective consciousness. I, I can call it the ether. And with that, I've been able to connect, to connect it with different things. And it opens up my, um, the ability to receive certain type of information um, when it kind of relates to that. I'm more open to it instead of shutting down the idea immediately. So as a creative, as a person that is putting things out into the world, into the universe for other humans to take in and to, and to understand, you never know how your interpretation of something, even if it's something you didn't discover or something that you're just reiterating or something that you did discover at the same time as somebody else, you don't know how your version is going to impact somebody. You don't know how that impact on that person is going to impact somebody else and et cetera, and et cetera. And that's how I feel like that's how we move our species forward. That's how we, as a species, continue our development and our advancement. Um, <clears throat> so you're not the first. And it's okay that you're not the first. You don't have to be. I mean, I honestly, that should feel like a weight off your shoulders. Like, do you know how much pressure it is on yourself to always have to be the first? Or how much pressure it is for you to be the very best in your field. That's a lot of pressure. That's unnecessary pressure. Aside from the fact that you're not alone. Because I promise you there is at least one other person out of the 9 billion of us that exist. That has similar ideas and thoughts as you do. Because we're all working off of the same information, off of the same concepts. concepts. So, like, I... It opens, it opens a door for collaboration. And it opens a door for you to give yourself grace. And humble yourself. And still do what you love to do because you love to do it and you have a voice and you have a way of saying it and doing it because why not, right? Like, what do you have to lose? Um, just because you're not the first doesn't mean you're not your artwork, your creation is not any less significant. Um, I found this really pretty quote during my research by Thomas Edison, <laughs> um, obviously invented light bulb and a bunch of other things throughout his life. And again, I, I think that's another simultaneous invention, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> he says, I never had an idea in my life. My so-called inventions already existed in the environment. I took them out. I've created nothing. Nobody does. There is no such thing as an idea being brain-born. Everything comes from the outside. And with that, I close out this conversation. I feel like trying to add to it is just beating a dead horse. So that's all I got to say about cosmic consciousness and creativity. Um, if you're interested in learning more, though, please check out um, the books that I put in the show notes. Very interesting stuff. Um, it may click for you. It may not. But all I'm saying is be open. Be open to possibilities. Be open to opportunities. Be open to life. You never know what's coming your way or what you will see that to you it might be duh. To others, it might not be. So take advantage of that. Take advantage of your unique perspective your unique insight, and your unique experiences. 
so that's my episode for today guys um i did want to add sorry it's been a rough week um i did want to add that this is the end of season two um episode 24 if i'm not mistaken which means i am going to go on a hiatus for about two to three weeks um just so that I can kind of do some revamps, um, do some new things. Hopefully I come back with new intro music um, and outro music, um, probably starting a new piece. Let's see how that goes. Um, I do want to show you all, I do want to continue working on the one that I've been working on during this season um, for you all so that you guys can still experience that and see the final version. Um, I think I just might let those go out on it on social media instead um just so that season three comes around and we're starting a fresh new piece and hopefully i can finish it <laughs> i'll time it as best as i can to finish it um by the end of season three um in season three i do have a bunch of new guests it'll be interesting um to see i'm st- Uh, Like I've always been saying, still in the learning phase. I'm still in the growing phase. I'm not uh, any way about it. I don't feel any way about it. Um, Lastly, if there's if there's something that you're interested in seeing new or seeing different um for this upcoming season shoot me a message on social media um my instagram is at stscoto e-s-c-o-t-o um i'm also doing tiktok videos now not often but i I do them you could also find me on tiktok at scotoartstudio.com not dot com oof (laughs) that's my website (laughs) the website is scotoartstudio.com um and yeah and just be on the lookout for that reach out to me i'm i'm still available um just you won't see another episode for another two or three weeks okay thank you all again for listening thank you for joining me on season two it's been 24 awesome episodes uh this has been a great um experience to just have And I appreciate you all for, you know, following me on this ride. So with that being said, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, Stay creative. And remember, be your unique self. There's no one out there in this world that is just like you. Bye, guys.